Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals, and uh, welcome to everybody in FSI. Got a got a few people here. We <laughs> we may have scared some folks off with earlier live stream. Anybody get a chance to see that one? I thought the conversation was so. The conversation actually went almost exactly like they go uh, when they're not being filmed. Of course, when you turn the camera on, it's not always clear how uh how authentic you can remain still <clears throat> and so after having like two years worth of conversations with her i'm going to go back later and ask her like did you feel like i was less authentic with the camera on than the way i act out of volleyball when the cameras aren't on Let's see what see what kind of feedback i get there which will help me calibrate like what i feel say and do or at least inform me. No, oh, that'd be interesting. She might actually have an impression about the real you. Like there might be a middle ground, um, you know, like the volleyball you and the channel host you right, are, right. are neither necessarily the real you. There's, there's a Kevin in between those two. Mm. that uh you know so whatever feedback she gives you um i don't know i would i would keep that in mind yeah i'd be curious yeah it was completely completely unscripted and uh i yeah i i had a good time but it, and one of the things i'm thinking about is uh it, with life being a series of encounters like how do we have how do we have non-rivalrous encounters with people? And so when people tune into a channel like this, they might be thinking, well, what, what will this channel teach? What truths will it try to impart to me? But I think, <clears throat> I think some things in life are more like a dance or listening to a song you like. You don't do it necessarily to... Uh, or if you just go for a drive for enjoyment sometimes, you don't do it necessarily to have a specific takeaway. You do it to practice doing the thing or to enjoy doing the thing. Or like out of volleyball, if you just play a game of pickup volleyball, why are you doing that? Are you trying to leave? With... So it's the encounters, like practicing, practicing having good, authentic, non-rivalrous encounters. <clears throat> so that was, uh, that's kind of what I'm, trying to do and the same thing we do here at FSI is ideally to have an, an authentic non-rivalrous encounter and it is is also interesting to see how it goes differently when the camp when we're live streaming versus when we are not live streaming well, authentic encounters gives a lot of leeway for a lot of spontaneity and surprise interactions that leave good memories and mm -hmm. um, learning experiences too for that matter i think yeah. the more authentic you are dancing may be actually a better analogy for that than you may have known if you've ever taken like a ballroom dancing instruction they they talk about the connection and if, if it's too light you don't you, you lose contact and you can no longer communicate with each other, but you don't mm -hmm. want to be pushing the other person around either. And so you always have to keep you, both parties have to try to keep that balance the same. And they will okay. actually do exercises for that. Like a good tension, not a bad mm -hmm. tension, but a good tension. <clears throat> Tonos. That's interesting. That's interesting to like, uh, you think the tension is bad, but think of tension on both ends of a guitar string it's needed in order to produce the sound mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's it seems to me in in your first conversation or the earlier conversation today there were a lot of folks coming into the chat with an expectation that the channel was going to identify some mark on some map that everyone was supposed to arrive at right, um, right. and it's unfortunate that so many people have missed so much of your content. Apparently that's like, that's, that's not the thing that we're trying to do. Um, but 
it it is interesting to watch sometimes. So, um, <clears throat> I want to say a couple of things that I, I was trying to debate in my mind whether I want to go back and play this portion again or if I just say it from the last segment we listened to with Derek Webb to see what this brings up. Some pieces I wrote down that I wanted to hit on. He says, uh, I forget exactly where he said this, uncertain about all that stuff. He says, black sheep aren't lost they're just pioneers and he mentioned people like richard Rohr, rob bell and maybe maybe he could be in that category i don't know um did that did that strike anybody else anybody else notice that phrasing he said black sheep aren't lost they're pioneers Right. He said maybe maybe black sheep aren't lost, they're just pioneers. Because if you take someone like Richard Rohr, <clears throat> he gets a lot of flack for being some kind of heretic. Somebody just messaged me today and they or they made a comment today and they're like, Richard Rohr, isn't he into all that new age stuff? <laughs> you know, they're some kind of black sheep, you know. And I, you know, of course I have to tell them, you know, Richard Rohr calls new age uh hysteria and junk religion. He is not new age, but and then also, just because we recommend an author doesn't mean we recommend everything they say. But sure. he's a heretic in Catholic circles, and he's certainly a heretic <clears throat> in Baptist circles, or other evangelical circles. So then, what if instead of being a black sheep, what if he's the pioneer? Can I ask a question in that sense, in starting yeah. this? <clears throat> Where does, when we say black sheep, my mind reverts to the story of the 90 and nine. So is that, an, is that wrong? I mean, or where's the black sheep coming from? Because they're obviously a lost sheep, a lost sheep. Um, let's see. Or I don't even... get, I don't get the 90 and nine vibe. When I hear the term black sheep, I get somebody who doesn't behave like you're supposed to. Correct. Correct. Like you take us a, a, a litter of kids. <laughs> and one of them, like all of them, are becoming college graduates, but one of them is off in a motorcycle gang. That's the black sheep, you know? Correct. No, and that's where I'm coming from as well. I just want to make sure. Yeah, or just somebody who is um, not following the expectation or prescription. Correct. Which makes me think of a makes me think of a let me try to see if i let me see if i save this on my phone today uh yep this is a quote from nishi right he says an individual in individuals insanity is rare but in groups parties nations and epics it is the rule and i'll say that again an in individuals insanity is rare but in groups, parties, nations, and epics, it is the rule. And it it sounds it seems to me like maybe people like Martin Luther or Richard Rohr are noticing the insanity of the society that surrounds them, and they side they decide to try to think things through on their own. Which of course is going to get you labeled as a black sheep. I read a quote, or not a quote, but a statement today that it was kind of interesting because <clears throat> it's the oxymoron of what we're kind of really integrated with it says i i told our church today that if someone leave, ever leaves our church to go to another church our responsibility is to do the following love them champion them thank them for the time we had with them honor them be their best cheerleader then i told them when you run into them at target costco or so on, don't treat them like a leopard or like they walked away from the faith. Be kind, say hello, because in the end, we're building a kingdom, not castles. The only type of group that treats people indifferent when they leave their group are cults. Church, do better, love better, be better. It just struck, because too many times when somebody leaves the church, it seems like we try to or it seems like that cast is put on them that 
Well, they must not have ever been of us because they left us. Mm -hmm. Um, so something like we should love people who aren't in our in group. Correct. So we're, yeah. So you found that quote today. Yeah. Yes. I came across it today. <clears throat> um, Roberta posted a quote from Google. The phrase black sheep came from the occasional black sheep born into the white flock. Black wool was considered undesirable commercially because it can't be dyed. Uh, well, I thought of that too well is because of the story of um, uh, Jacob. And that's one of the other ones I was thinking of. Jacob. Yeah, Jacob and he saw when he went to... Uh, Stay with his um, with Laban and yeah, separated the flocks. Yeah, I'm thinking also with the if the ideology, where's my book? <laughs> if systematic theology is the die, and mm. some people won't take it, mm. maybe that's maybe something like that. Turn you into a black sheep. Yeah, they won't comply. That's a right. Yeah, yeah, or uh, another way, like a divergent thinker. Mm -hmm. Now, with what we're doing here, we value divergent thinking. You know, we it's ash negative. We want you to have divergent thinking. If if you all think the same thing, then I only have one perspective that I can interact with. Correct. Right. Any other thoughts on this black sheep idea? All right. We'll listen to uh, this. Uh, go ahead. My mind's going up to like how computers used to work, you know, back in like Windows 3.1. If you put, if you left a disk in the disk drive, the, the operating system wouldn't load because it was prompted to look there first for instruction. Oh. Yeah. And so yeah. you had to e eject it if you wanted it to continue to load. <laughs> That was both advantageous and disadvantageous because if there was a problem, there was an automatic way to fix it because it would always look there first. So you could put a corrective mechanism in there to mm -hmm. solve a problem. But if you put something bad in there, you could w break everything because that got the priority. And I think this black sheep thing, I'm kind of seeing the same way. The, you know, not taking the die can be a good thing, but it doesn't have to be. Oh yeah, like yeah. Could, so yeah. just just because they're not taking the programming doesn't mean that whatever they're doing is necessarily mm -hmm. good. Right. And it just means you're searching for code. Well, it also brings up another problem is that if if I'm doing divergent thinking, then I may not immediately know about or have access to other people who have tried to think like what is occurring to me. Mm -hmm. And and so what that means is I'm going to have sloppy, bad versions of it. Think of Rule Omega. I'm going to have sloppy, bad versions of whatever it is I'm trying to do or explore about as I start. And as I say things, as I'm trying to feel my way around and think differently, I may say things that sound heretical or crazy or cringeworthy or stupid or immoral. Yeah, that's how your chat felt earlier today. <laughs> the chat or the chat the, responding the, to it? The chat felt like witnessing this explode mode in yeah. public was somehow inappropriate. Um, that what was being demonstrated was the wrong thing because if you're going to lead, you should know where you're going is their expectation. Yeah, yeah. They don't realize that the process that you were engaged in was the thing being demonstrated, not the the mark on the map they expected you to lead everyone. Right. So that that was the challenge. That's a really good way to say that. Um, Jim put in one of my favorite quotes from Men in Black. Uh, a person is smart. 
people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the earth was flat. 15 minutes ago, you knew that humans were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite lines. A person is smart. People are dumb. All right. Well, I Go found ahead. it interesting. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I found it interesting. I was watching the video earlier, uh, and I saw a lot of people quoting in the chat about the Great Commission and things like that. And I was, uh, believe it or not, at the company I work for, it's a billion-dollar company. Um, we have a prayer group every Tuesday and Wednesday for an hour from noon to one. And there's a chaplain, <laughs> company chaplain, corporate chaplain. And it's very ecumenical. It's uh, been really good for me. I just recently started working at this place. And it's odd because we talked about the Great Commission this afternoon. And I thought, you know, I was like, I, the type of reformulating that's going on in my mind over, well, a lot recently, but even a lot in the last few years is, you know, what, what does that mean exactly? Because, I mean, I've seen... I've seen churches blow up over the Great Commission. I've seen churches split, stop fellowship with each other. I'm sorry, my am I when you when you say blow up, do you mean increase in size rapidly or disintegrate? Oh no, I, I mean I mean terrible. split part ways, fellowship over it because uh, yeah. you know, some people teach you know it's 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 not for today some people teach it was only to those who were with him and some people teach that it was you know a kingdom thing in the future um and those kinds of things and i not to get into that that sort of discussion at this right. time or anything like that but i i i thought you know it's scary to me because we obviously want to make disciples and exemplify christ likeness to people in their lives in our lives and make Jesus Christ and Christianity attractive to people who aren't familiar with it. But at the same time, the goal should not be bringing people into that particular theology or system mm -hmm. of way of doing things. Because like uh, we were talking about, like some people there are Catholic, some people there are Lutheran, some people there are Baptist, that sort of thing. And it's like, if I'm presenting as like going out <laughs> into the world and bringing people, I think you should be a Catholic. I think you should be a Baptist. I think you should be a, you know, fundam fundamental dispensationalist kind of thing. I just, I, I really struggle with understanding how to interpret scripture from a genuine biblical viewpoint rather than having it, biased and presupposed before I even read it, because I'm not sure that I've ever read it that way in my entire life. Well, I'll leave it at that. So you're not sure you've ever read it in an unbiased way before in your life? Well, I'm very willing to listen to all sorts. Yeah. From all sorts of different kinds of theology but it's typically someone spouting off a system that they've studied and know all the answers to that particular statement of faith or or systematic yep. position. And I can take those and I can soak them in and I can go to the scripture and read them and try to, uh, you know, evaluate whether or not I think that that perspective makes sense to me, opposed to what I already know or or think I know or have already thought. Um, but at the end of the day, are any of those perspectives what I should be taking with me when I go there? And I always pray to the Lord for His truth, and I believe that He's uh, faithful to answer and impart wisdom to those who are seeking. And I've always been a black sheep in my family, a black sheep in my church, a black sheep wherever I go. So, I mean, oh, well, and, you're going to fit in fine here. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's why I like it here so much, because I, I feel like I can express, you know, 
who who I truly am and how I really feel about things without having to go to war over it. Yeah, that perspective taking capability, the ability to take in a, a perspective in a non rivalrous way, genuinely consider it also without having to adopt it. Like you can genuinely understand it without feeling like you need to identify with it. That's, that's a mark of development. So that's, that's one of the things that I'm trying to instill in people on this channel in this audience is to get people to be able to do that. I can hear a perspective. I can understand it. I can see through those lenses and then I can take those lenses right back off and, uh, and do all of it in a non rivalrous domain dynamic. Mm -hmm. That's why I appreciated his genuine honesty when he mentioned the there's times of educated theology was some of his most critical mental moments of his life because it didn't allow that um consider it ad consider it thoughtful mindset towards others i mean it was one way or the my way or the highway which i remember being back when i was you know <clears throat> younger and back in those Hiles days huh <laughs> oh, man. We're ready to try a segment out of this of this week's video. This week's video segment. Sure. All right, let me um picking up at uh oh Mark's trying to come in at uh, number ten thirty four. At uh, mile, mile marker ten thirty four timestamp. I don't think it shared the right one. I don't know what. There we go. There we go. Right. Yes. Yeah. But at the time he looked crazy and so anyways it's like john the baptist jesus you know martin luther name yeah. name them all but they all look crazy so i was like what if all these people who like identify themselves in the christian or the progressive christian movement mm -hmm. a lot of them are seem crazy i've got friends in this town who are pastors in the progressive church movement and everybody thinks they're nuts right. they won't listen to them they won't go to their and it's like you guys but maybe that's Maybe that's how it starts. Maybe we need people who yeah. look nuts to pull us back and arc us back around the right way. Yeah. You know, and so that's really the whole thing with the record is like, I'm going gonna... to. I'm going to stop right there. Not much at all. So progressive Christian church movement. Maybe that's what it takes. What do you all think about that? I was thinking on that today. And my question or my thought is, is. Does this word progressive church movement, does this word progressive get stuck in the same category as when we're talking about in politics today is progressive, progressive, progressive movement, if you will. So I don't know, Kyle, if you want to. It does ahead. seem does seem to have some overlap, uh, but I think they are distinct. You know, when you have progressives in politics, um, I usually think of them as like a leftward moving group from the current left. And they're um, where that's where I'm at. Yeah. Politically, yeah. Yes. And then, and then in Christianity, I think there's a lot of folks that identify as conservative Christians and they see themselves on the Christian right. And then, and everything left of them is the left. And as soon as something uh, that seems to champion things that the political left also champion, they just immediately um, kind of frame them in the same respect. And and honestly, I think there's some human nature there, um, pattern recognition, and the idea of categorization that's fair um i think we should expect that that's going to happen 
but I also think if we're going to talk about it, we should know the difference. Um, it, it seems like those that get lumped into the progressive religious uh, environment are the ones who might be um, you know, performing uh, LGBTQ uh, weddings or something like that uh, as, as one of the hallmarks that that distinctively sets them firmly in a quote unquote progressive uh, segment of, of Christianity. Um, anybody want to riff off of that? Yeah. Um, so the terms can be confusing because <clears throat> I think, yeah, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, uh, Kyle at all, but the terms progress basically if you have a con a conservative wants to conserve what is and they that's where they're most comfortable and somebody a progressive is ideally somebody who just wants to make progress and so that's really what the that's all the terms mean right and then the real issue is where do we find the balance between not staying so conserved that we're stale and we're not dynamic and have no movement um, a, a pond full of, you know, a pond of still water is absolutely conserved, but then what happens to it? It starts growing all kinds of things and it's no longer fresh. There's got to be some kind of movement somewhere. Um, so the, the manifestation of how churches that call themselves progressive, how they show up and what they do is probably a connotative it's connotatively understood that progressive churches are going to be doing contemplative prayer and doing lgbt weddings or something like that like like what kyle was talking about i if you look through the terms of through the lens of spiral dynamics i think that that kind of church that's doing those kinds of things not that's banner waving if you will like egoic banner waving I, I identify as Black Lives Matter. I identify as Occupy Wall Street. I identify as LGBTQ. Like none of those things are you. So anybody that's waving an egoic banner is an, an unhealthy version of green consciousness, really. And so I would I would not align myself with those people while I do think that it's important to make everyone should be making some kind of progress. Yeah. And what does that right. look like? And then at any institution we should too. I, I would want to remind some folks who, you know, are getting out their pitchforks and making down with the progressive church banners. Um, you know, like 30, 40 years ago, most of the churches that they're attending today would have been called progressive 30, 40 years ago. The fact that they've got electric drum kits or, or even lights or screens or, yeah. um, you know, Projectors all, and all, that. all of that stuff yeah. was no, no, that, that we don't do in church. Um, so, you know, yes, I that's think they're wondering. Go ahead, James. That's why I was wondering is if maybe the word progressive without going to the denominational side of it could be, how could that compare to maybe the, the personality of being charismatic? I'm not talking about again tongues, any of that stuff. I'm just talking about personality. Like a charismatic maybe. leader. Correct. Yeah. I I think with all of it, um, some one of the mantras that we have here unofficially is to be in right relationship, right? With one another and with the world, uh, with how we maybe model uh what we what we say we believe um i think there's we don't want to dispense or or kind of put our wisdom at the doorway and carry on uh without discernment when we go into church um so some of some of what the more conservative minded folks might be bringing up aren't necessarily bad points sure. some of what some of what somebody who 
considers themselves progressive might also not be necessarily bad points. It's kind of Jordan Peterson, you know, you've got one foot not on either side uh, so that there's a healthy tension. You're not, you know, all in on the super safe route and you're not all in on the chaos route. You've got a little bit of um, movement, like Kevin was saying, uh, without going completely off the rails um, or being completely still. So, um, yeah, I, progressive is, to me, these days, just feels like a new label to other somebody. Um, yeah. And it's convenient. It's it's uh oh i bet you since they don't do it the way we do it they're probably one of those progressive churches they may not know anything about what that church does on a sunday morning or however they conduct themselves they may do nothing like what's imagined um but it's just easy it's just easy to say yeah they're not like us they're probably doing it wrong without even giving it a real uh consideration um, but maybe the other you. terms we often use in the political camp are are more appropriate, like the the left and right terms, because those terms there's that you never get to. Okay, I am left, right? There's always more for, more more left or more right in real space, right? And the the progressive and conservative terms can be erroneous because you can have a church that because of like traits you've been labeling would 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 be identified as progressive but it's not moving anywhere. It's, it's, it's dead. There's no water flowing. And you could have a conservative church that that word kind of be mislabeled because it's trying to move. It's just trying to move in that opposite direction. And, and conservative can be just as, as uh, bad of a label because people hear that and immediately words like dead or stale or old fashioned come up. And th those aren't necessarily true you, you can have a church with a, with a full trap set and stuff that has is very conservative in belief and practice, you know. Uh, so the words don't are always the definition of the words aren't always that descriptive of what they're actually trying to. to so let's um, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's say that the eight of us are all in a raft in the middle of the ocean in every direction you look, uh, you just see horizon. And then I say, all right, guys, let's make some progress. What do we do? First, Start I would want to have a <laughs> about where we think we're at. Otherwise, there. we're just wasting yeah. our energy. Where are we? And then where we're trying to be. You know, what direction do we need to go? Yeah. And so that would define progress. If we if we all agree that we're headed toward XYZ horizon where the sun is, for example. But then we start going the other way by accident. That would be lack of progress. We could clearly define that that was not progress based on how we've defined it, which means we need to def like what defines progress. Getting closer to your goal. Yeah. So then, so if I'm talking about a church, what is mm -hmm. progress? In my opinion, it's exemplifying Christ's likeness, living like he lived, putting on Christ. Um, so, yeah, I want to get more specific. Like, here's good. something I'm actually struggling with. I'm not exactly sure how to do this without being labeled as some kind of crazy person. Yeah. But I think that unless somebody is just absolutely so antisocial, you can't do anything with them, I think we can interact with people just about anybody in some way to help them, you know, reach for the next rung on their ladder of transformation. Doesn't matter what situation they're in, what they believe, what kind of lifestyle they got going on. Maybe there's something that you can do to help them get a little more set in a good way than before. Now there might be disagreements on what that is, but so let's say that you're dealing with somebody who is um, same sex attracted. There's, there's some things that I think that, okay, first of all, we shouldn't, I don't think we should be waving any banners. It's not like, Oh, we're going to wave the rainbow flag. We're not going to do that, but we're also not going to exclude them 
from the possibility of interacting in a way that might result in their edification or ours. And the pro- how do we do that? And and I, and I'm asking that because I, based on how church models are, how do we? Um, I think the typical conservative church is not does not really have a place for these people at all. So how do we interact with these people, treat them with dignity and respect, and still offer Christ to them without? judgmentally demanding that they change the one sin that's glaring to us the most more than anybody else. Can I share a thought? Uh, yeah. Um, when I first got saved, uh, my, my uncle was the one who gave me the, the gospel and I, he was, he was very quick to tell me, um, I just flat out, I was extremely heavy into drugs and you name it. I was, if it felt good, I did it. I loved it. Okay. That was my life. Um, But he was very quick to tell me, don't start, you know, putting things in the sin bin and, and turning from all these, all these things that you do in your normal daily life. Because sin is not any longer the issue. And as you grow and learn more and I guess progress in this case towards the goal of being more like your savior, he will replace those things that you're using to fill an empty void in your life. I don't care if it's drugs or sex or music or whatever it is. And you can't just turn off how you feel about certain things just be it, it's not a it's not a magic boom oh i'm not like that anymore yeah i heard um yeah i agree with that and also i mean what you just said reminds me of of paul's famous passage in philippians 3 i press toward the mark so if we're going to be making progress what is that mark what, identify what is that mark where are we going And so, yeah, people can't just turn those things off. I was listening. I actually wasn't listening to it personally. I was listening to a a Christian therapist review a debate between James White and somebody who was, it was about whether or not somebody can be a gay Christian. And the gay Christian was advocating that he wasn't advocating practicing homosexuality. He's just like, I'm same sex attracted. I can't do anything about that. I'm not going to act on that. I'm going to be celibate, but I can still follow Christ. And James White's argument, if I understood it correctly, and I reserve the right to retract this, if I misheard what I thought I heard was that if you're genuinely saved and genuinely a Christian, then that will change. Otherwise you're not really saved. And I'm like, that is, so obtuse (laughs) it's such an obtuse thing to say uh just not relating with somebody else's sin or or sin tendencies essentially until until the next life we're all gonna struggle with certain certain temptations i mean we could say the same thing about james white like if you were really saved you wouldn't gaslight people and mis misrepresent what they say and misrepresent their arguments we could say that we could pick whatever we wanted to and then uh, use that as a litmus test to say he's not really saved. I just kind of feel like um, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he just says, uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I feel like he wouldn't have to say that if the newly born Christian mind was all of a sudden converted. That's a really good point. Because the first thing they're going to think of is, hey, I can do what I want. And like, no, that's not the point. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it's either unmerited favor or it isn't. I mean, I, and I, and maybe we can, you know, I don't, I don't know if we steer the conversation that way, but that's how I have always looked at it. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Take Romans 6 1 in that way. Well, you take the same sex thing out of it. The same implication would imply if, 
you know, what, what, once you're married and you're a Christian, well, there would be no, you, 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 you could find out they for sure weren't a Christian if they committed adultery or something, because a Christian wouldn't do that. It's, it's or just, just lust or just yeah. attraction. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just going to remove yeah, the I, limbic system out of your head. Right. I did the jail ministry for a number of years and be surprised how many people are in jail that claim to be Christians. And, um, one of the things that I learned after so many years of doing it is that when we, when I hear things like that, just to go back in their story to the very beginning and find out how they became a Christian in the first place, what it is that, what was it that they believed in order to, to put that label on themselves? And invariably <laughs> it was some uh, works ideology. It was some heretical baptism of regeneration or some other view other than, um, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that they were depending on. And so uh, for me, it's always been, that's kind of the key when I when I talk to anybody. If I talk to them for the first time is to, to try to not ask them if they're a Calvinist or an Arminian or a provisionist, but to, you know, to try to feel them out, to find out what is it that they actually believed in the first place? What is it that that, that brought them to Christ and, and what is it that they're depending on to keep them in Christ? Um, and I think that when, especially when people are having issues uh, with lust or whatever it is, and unless they get that foundation correct, or at least close to correct, there's no hope for them to really have any progressive movement in a in a positive direction. So that's just a, that's always been my uh, point of view on that whole. That whole issue. Yeah, so no, so no genuine progress could be made if yes. you're not. Yeah, you have to start with a great with a foundation that that works. Um, otherwise, yeah. it doesn't. It, it may take time. There are a lot of people out there that are very disciplined and um, and they have a great background. They have good security around them, um, and so they can pull it off for a, a long time, like James White. He's got a, you know, he's got a, I assume, a decent income and a good education, a good, good family life. And for the most part, you know, he can, he can be as legalistic as he wants and nobody's going to know the difference. Uh, but when God takes out the props from all of that, um, when his child dies or he loses his job or his wife leaves him or something really, really bad happens, then you find out what the real man believes. And a lot of times it's a, it's a false belief. Yeah. So I yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um Kyle got your hands up. Yeah, um kind of trying to remember exactly how you phrased the initial proposition. Something like if if somebody you know you're trying to dialogue with um is same sex attracted, what do you do or how do you how do you be uh yeah how do you how do you interact with them in a healthful way that's edifying and all that and and okay. i think individually that's pretty easy but it's not so easy uh institutionally if you're trying to do so from as a christian representing a particular denomination yeah so so thank you for clearing that um so not that long ago I would have said that doing it individually is easy. But the more I like stop to really think of of those past interactions, what I could have done better, I realized that there were some things that I was leaving out. Yeah, let me let me qualify that just by saying not as much opposition from fellow believers. For sure. For that, sure. That's okay. kind of what I mean by easy. Yep. I'm not, I don't mean that there's not difficulties, but like if I, if I try to help uh, same sex attracted people officially from a church leadership standpoint, you're going to get all kinds of flack from everybody telling you you're doing it wrong, you're immoral, or something else. Yeah. But if I'm just having a a one on one conversation over mm -hmm. a table out at Mangoes, uh, yeah. I'm probably not going to get a lot of flack about that. Yeah, yeah. I so something that I have to do for myself before I engage is to ask myself, uh, how committed am I? Um, is this a, is this a one 
conversation commitment? Is this a, a year long conversation commitment? Is this a till I die commitment? What, what level of commitment do I have to see this person through to whatever the end goal might reveal itself to be? How so does invested? there have to be that though? Like what if well, I'm, what if I'm interacting with somebody because of some other commonality? I'm not, I'm not trying to place any moral uh, trip on anyone. This is just my, uh, this is like a personal check. I've got to, I got to take on and know not to set improper expectations in my engagement um, that I, as a Christian, professing Christian, will not be following through on. So, like, I have to think to myself, okay, like, legitimately, will I ever even see this person again? Is it likely, knowing how distracted I get, am I going to follow through at this, you know, am I good at that? Um, there are certain things that I'm just not very good at. I haven't developed to my liking um, where I feel like it would be appropriate for me to make certain commitments and promises to an individual that I'm not actually fully committed in seeing through. And so um, I have to, I have to evaluate before I engage what am, what am I really committed uh, to do? I I've been in situations where Christians have said and made uh, commitments to me um, that they never followed through on. And it left an impression on me that, oh, that was Christianity. And I made a, I, the reason I have this for myself is I don't want to set that bar, that, that example, um, you know, the, the idea that I may be the only Bible anybody that this individual ever reads. Uh, I may be the only person that they ever come across that, you know, uh, really seem to take Christ seriously. How am I following through on that, that relationship? Um, so that, that would be actually my first, uh, check. It would be an internal one. And then external would be, um, try and figure out where they're at. Do, do they even see an issue the same way I might see the issue. Because if they're not ready to move, if they're not ready to budge, if they're not looking for help, maybe they're just, maybe they just need somebody to listen. Um, how can I be the best listener that they know happens to be Christian at the same time? Maybe that's my role in that. Not to give them advice, not to, but actually right. be the very first Christian to ever ever listened. Um, that happens more than uh, I think. That needs to happen more than uh, I think. A lot of Christians are willing to engage on. It's it's almost like they'll they're willing to engage as long as uh, the person gets an earful of what they should be doing. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I appreciated about <clears throat> the interview is that um forgive me that without remembering the name but the interviewer if you will to web was there was no there was no calm condemnation and no bias i mean it was a very neutral um without making people think otherwise, fluid conversation. I mean, don't take that word and run with it, but it was just a very open dialogue, fluid conversation. And there was no bias. There was no condemnation. And I, that's, that's the one thing about the, the interview, if you will, that I enjoyed. I mean, there was, if you will, it seemed like the rule Omega was there and they didn't even know it. I think there might've been, a little bias because they were in the same in group, not just professionally, but from what the interviewer said, it sounded like he was in the same place spiritually. I can see where you're coming from. Yeah. I think a lot of the interactions 
a lot of the interactions that I have with people are not because I'm a Christian. Because like, you know, we had that conversation today with Laura. We we both play volleyball. And I, I go to I go to volleyball, there's all kinds of people there. And we I talk, ask them how their game's going sit and have a quesadilla with somebody you know there's, there's just all kinds of interactions that you have with people and we're interacting because we're both at volleyball and because we happen to know each other and if there's a social gathering and a lot of people get together at somebody's house that's the commonality it's not because anybody's expecting any kind of influence from you we're just hanging out and having a good time so the uh i guess like what impact how can i be in a way that is uh impacting people in a positive way all the time through those kinds of encounters where there's there may not be there is no succession of encounters for any particular purpose and nobody i don't have anybody's particular sins in mind that i'm trying to change nor do they think that i have that on you know their issues on my mind or vice versa um, Jim, you had your hand raised and put it back down. Oh, we kind of steered away from the, the subject. The, the James White pronouncement is just so frustrating to me because it's easy for him to make that kind of a statement when it's, a, let's say, an activity, a behavior that it wouldn't even cross his mind to engage in. But, you know, uh, Year, many years ago, I attended a church where, where it was, I think, I don't, I can't remember if the pastor said this to me privately or if he said it from the pulpit, but it's like, we have a safe environment here. So we're, you know, that's why, uh, you, know, you know, we don't want anybody to drink alcohol, uh, but they would allow smokers to smoke outside. Okay. So now it's a degree. It's a matter of degree. Um, and we want a safe environment here because some people can't handle alcohol. But they would, we had these wonderful covered dish lunches where, where there's 14,000 calorie desserts are being brought in. And there's a lot of overweight people in there that shouldn't be exposed to that type of thing. But that's not unsafe. And there's this mm. matter of degree and how does it affect, how does it affect me? You know, it, I know that wasn't a conscious decision, but you no. Know, that's like we pick and select the category from yeah, which we will keep you safe. Yeah, exactly. You know, certain <laughs> things are more dangerous than others, and we're going to define what those are. It, it's 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 a little bit like your 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 video about how this mentality creates, you know, you know, let's say sexual abuse or or the oh. sex, you know, all all of that because we're we're categorizing these things based on our own personal preferences or what we've been taught. <clears throat> and it's very easy to, to, to create those, those categories for other people to live by. Uh, I have, I have some friends that grew up Mennonite. They are still Mennonite, but they're not your standard Mennonites. They mm -hmm. don't drive cars with black bumpers uh, and when you go to their church, it's a very charismatic, you know, capital C charismatic kind of environment. And the this couple sang at our wedding. We got very close to them and they explained to us what happens in like the Mennonite church or or uh, or uh, an Amish church because it's controlled by the local people. And when new leaders come in, they they make up new rules for people to live by based on their own personal prejudices or whatever I'll, I'll save you the the weird example that was given to us but it was it was it was all about somebody's okay this is what i focus on when i go to church and i want people to stop focusing on that now i'm all curious about what your weird example was <laughs> i could share it with you it's not too crass i'm i'm down Okay. okay this, uh, the reason in one particular church, the reason women had to wear <clears throat> garments with sleeves that covered their entire arm was because some new leader in the church thought an elbow looked too much like a woman's breast. And 
the hilarious thing, I'm sitting there, I wasn't married to my wife yet, but we're sitting there at the island in this Mennonite house, the, the, the woman who's explaining it to us, and she looks at me and she says, Jim, would that turn you on? And like it didn't until now. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know what, what am I saying. <laughs> you just that? changed it for me. <laughs> you just changed my salience landscape for elbows. <laughs> Thank you very much. And and now you know the young men ride around with signs that say "Show me your elbows." That's it's ridiculous. <laughs> Get a lot of beads for some good elbows. <laughs> Mardi Gras time. <laughs> that's. That's got to be one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. Well, there you go. And it's not even a Tuesday. It's not it's not even a Tuesday. Wow. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. You'll never see elbows the same way, I can tell you that. That's true. That's true. That'll really mess up your salience landscape. It, make, it makes me wonder what his basis of comparison is. Because I'm like, I don't see it crazy and then why and it seemed i think maybe all those people were the ones commenting in the earlier video today <laughs> people are i just... think the best thing we can do is just to to be ourselves and to reflect who and where we are in our spiritual journey and be honest about it and um i I was told many years ago, you, nobody wants to be your project. And I think that's true. I don't want to be anybody's project. Yeah, um, that's, yeah. But I do want to have an open dialogue and a conversation with people. And if it comes up, it comes up. We don't have to, you know, fill in all the blanks for everybody. We just have to answer their questions and be who we are. Like your volleyball game. I mean, you know, you don't have to get up on a soapbox and give a three-point sermon with an opening prayer before you play volleyball. You just go play volleyball. And yeah, when I was in the military, I was in, in a situation where I was dealing with a lot of kids that were away from home for the first time. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I flew the Christian flag, but I didn't wave it like some people do. So when they had issues, a lot of times they'd come and say, Hey, can I talk to you privately? Because, you know, the, you know, when their marriage is on the rocks or whatever, they don't go to their buddies particularly for that kind of great advice. Um, so I happened to be the guy that they came to. And I didn't try to be that guy. I just just was there. Right, right. Yeah, that happened a lot in the military for me as well. Yeah. So can I riff off of what Mark just said? So you said, I didn't try to be that guy. Um, it seems to me there's a lot of Christians trying not to be that guy. And they try not to be that guy by being ultra in your face about mm -hmm. being the Christian. It's like they, yeah. they, um, I have a hunch that most of them don't want to do one on one, uh, actual investment. And, Instead, it's way easier to make proclamations from a distance and stand on the soapbox and, and act pious and tell everybody else what they're doing wrong. But by doing that, it ushers in a future where very few people will come to them, which is what I presume they wanted all along. Preaching is easy. Discipleship is hard. Yeah. Uh, discipleship is probably a lot harder if you're not Mr. Miyagi, too. You know, if you, if you have nothing to offer, and you you really, it's like the blind leading the blind. Discipleship's hard when you're blind leading the blind. Nick S., who usually joins us on FSI when we're not live streaming, he said, as a baby, I struggled to put on weight. I now know I was elbow fed. <laughs> what have you done? Richard. So today is funny. Again, at, at a, a prayer group, we were talking about um, 
being present. And it was, it was, the advice was listening for the sake of understanding, not for the sake of responding, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, God, that's so valuable, man. I mean, cause like, you know, I've, I, when I was younger, it was like, Oh, I couldn't wait to say my thing, you know? And, and then, and then later years I was like, yeah, you know, you got to pay closer attention and hear what people are saying and be ready to, <laughs> you know, give that, that respond to your two cents. And it's like, you know, I've, I've, I'm really learning to try to understand people better because sometimes we think we know what they mean by the words they use. And we might have no clue what they really meant by those words. Cause in those words in my vocabulary mean a completely different thing to me mm -hmm. than they do to them. Sometimes we can be in full agreement without even realizing. It. And sometimes we can be, worlds apart but think that we're we're like this you know um my sister's best friend is gay she's a professing atheist i um known him since i was old like eight <laughs> you know, something like that you know what i do when i see him i give him a hug and ask him how he's doing and how his family's doing and those kinds of things mm -hmm. you know i i i go bowling on monday nights for many years, I quit doing that because, well, my personal life, I had a drinking problem and I thought it was good to get away from environments that were, you know, triggering to me. But for a lot of years, I also thought, oh, you know, there's, there's smoke in there and there's drinking there and there's swearing there and they're all, oh, you know, and it's bad. And it was funny because maybe I want to say six or seven years ago, my wife and I were considering putting our kids in a, in a Christian school and the pastor of that church wanted us to sign all sorts of doctrinal statements and agreements and this and that. And we wouldn't take our kids to R-rated movies and we wouldn't go to the, you know, restaurants, bars, places like that that are serving alcohol and those kinds of things. And ultimately, uh, we didn't we didn't sign on to that. But not more than six months ago, I, Saturday morning, I took my wife and the kids bowling. There was that pastor with his wife and his grandkids of the son-in-law of his who's taking over as pastor for that church. And I'm like, I don't have a problem with you being here at all because I don't think it's wrong to be here. <laughs> but there you are. Having all your people sign these doctrinal statements and agreements that you won't participate in these kinds of things and when people like my sister, for instance, they see that pure hypocrisy as Christianity. And, you know, I, 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 I try to show somewhat of a, to try to be a level above that. And I've been there a million times where I've been the hypocrite. I'm not saying I haven't. You know, but um, I'm trying to I'm trying to rise to a higher level of understanding that um, isn't about shoving my understanding of things down people's throat rather than than sharing what's valuable to help make all people better. <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I I found that the places that make you want to sign things that make you sign things that you will and won't do if you're affiliated with them or if you hold a certain position, really all they're doing is they're, they're precipitating a, like a, like hypocrisy, lack of transparency and virtue signaling. Because at the end of the day, everyone's gonna, I remember I was part of a church when I was a kid and we weren't allowed no, none of the church members were members were allowed to buy gasoline from gas stations that sold pornography or alcohol. Well, it wasn't long before they all sold it all. So, what are you going to do? Not get gas? You know, what are you going to do? And then, and then also, it caused me to every time I walk into a gas station, I notice the pornography and the alcohol is the first thing that I look at. 
because I'm not supposed to go in there if they have that. Like, why would you want to condition somebody to look for those things when they go into a place? And so then they had to change the rule. I'm like, well, was the rule good or not? If it's mm. good, maybe we should all go to horse and buggies then. Stop buying gasoline. Otherwise, maybe it wasn't a good rule. Like, So it's only good as long as you don't have to pay too much of a price for it. Mm. <laughs> I, just, I just think it's uh, any kind of signing that you will and won't do certain things is counterproductive to the cultivation of wisdom. People it's a curse. Yeah. It's, it's a curse. We curse ourselves when we do that. Because our nature, you know, we're putting ourselves under the flesh to not do it. And the flesh is going to fail every time. And it, it just inflames the flesh. The harder you try to not do it, the more you want to do it. That's true. Is there a bit of an owner's manual perspective to it? Like maybe somebody who had a good perspective on it is trying to help other people kind of like get where he's at. And so you put a manual together and trying to be helpful, but then in some ways you're hindering because then people think they have to do those steps. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that to it. Maybe uh, some, you know, X, Y, Z Christian happens to be very effective in some way. And then you look at what he did and you're like, oh, he doesn't watch TV and doesn't go to places that sell alcohol, whatever it is. And then you codify that. And for, so there's probably a really good reason to want to model after this guy. But when you think that you can codify the things that he's not doing and think that that will produce the thing, the good things that he is, it's uh, it's missing the point entirely. There, there seems to be this uh, this weird, this weird tendency. Um, so, like, imagine a cliff. Okay, uh, it's right at the edge of a a walking path, and somebody stumbled off the walking path and almost fell off the cliff. They now warn everybody on the walking path, "Hey, there's a cliff there." Don't go there. It's dangerous. And as they're backing away from the walking path, as they're backing away from the cliff, they're yelling at everybody that's kind of headed that way. Uh, You're too close. You're too close. Just it, they're incensed by this danger. Now, what they're not doing is asking if anybody on that walking path happens to be uh, mountain climbers. Like they're there for the reason that there's a cliff. Um, there, the cliff isn't necessarily sin. Um, yeah. the the cliff isn't um, necessarily bad. For example, there are um, there are folks that used to be in industries that are of an X-rated nature. They lived those lives, and now they are going back into those arenas to witness and be light in darkness that they are now set free from. They're, they're dressed different, but this is their mission field. This is a place where they've been called to, but... Christians get this sense of, well, it's dangerous no matter what. And they they have probably the right heart. You know, that to them, that place is just evil. Uh, it's nothing but danger at that cliff. You just shouldn't do it. So I think their heart is probably right. But it's being their heart is overtaken it's it's preventing any kind of patience it's preventing any kind of dialogue they're they're not engaged with the individual for any potential like righteous pur- purpose behind going toward the cliff um 
for all you know, there's actually somebody stuck on the cliff and those are emergency personnel going to go save them. Um, like, the, like having a perspective of, of all the different possibilities that cliff entails, um, takes some patience, takes some considering of other ideas. And I think what we're witnessing is a bunch of people in the church that only sees red when they think of the cliff. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we say alcohol is the cliff for some people because they lived a very abusive scenario where they saw a bunch of people in their family not be able to handle alcohol. And so anybody who goes near a place that sells it, that's, that's just spells trouble. They're seeing red. They can't see otherwise. Um, you know, there are some folks that actually have a handle on having a right relationship with alcoholic beverages. Um, they just can't imagine that ever being the case though. So I'll, I'll stop my rant. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's, it's almost like uh, imagine a jagged edge cliff and everyone else is blind and they can't figure out the pattern to where it stops and starts. So they just stay away. And then as you get closer, they think you're crazy, but they don't realize what it's like to see. I think too, there's like Kyle said, a patience that goes with it, but there's also a caregiving aspect to it because you can't, I think when, when we see somebody headed for some dangerous, what we consider to be some dangerous aspect of their lives, we, we go in there expecting to tell them what the problem is and for them to respond and be wow, thanks for sharing that, you know, and then end up exactly where we are with our same mentality rather than giving them the care they need to move from point A to point B, however long that may take, but to be there with them rather than to expect them to have a changed mind immediately and to, oh, thank you, thank you for rescuing me out of this, because that's typically not the way it goes, I don't think. Um, but I found myself being impatient with people, thinking, why don't you understand this? Why don't you see this? And it takes time sometimes, and you have to allow them to have that growth and the opportunity to think through it. Yeah, the, it does take time sometimes. Uh, that's what's hard we tend to think we're left hemispheric and Cartesian. We're thinking, we tend to think that if you can explain it and I can understand it, that's all that's needed. But some things actually, they have, it's like film that has to develop in a dark yes. room. Yes. It just takes its time. What if, you, um, if you were to think of, uh, I'm not very good at juggling. I can juggle three oranges or three baseballs, you know, somewhat decently for about a half a minute. And then I'm like, start fumbling over myself. If you, hand me six knives and tell them, tell me to jungle them all or six fire sticks. I'm like, why are you doing that? Because I don't have the capacity to do that. It seems unstable and unsafe to me, but that doesn't mean that somebody else can't do that. And so the, we have different degrees of sovereignty in different domains. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that when something looks unstable to us, we think it's going to be unstable to to them we can't imagine ourselves doing it so there's this i watched this one girl do bicycle tricks and it to me looks like she's going to fall over and break her leg every time but she can do it i can't but yeah. it's and i think different people have different capacities and we want to set rules around which around the things that we are comfortable with and so a church that is cause asking people to sign do and don't stuff there it oftentimes becomes a cult of that pastor's preferences well what would what would the prodigal son parable look like in a modern christian sense the dad wouldn't let his son go he'd probably lock him up in his room and say no you can't go like there at some point you do have to in my opinion um some some of life needs to just be experienced and you need 
as a like as a dad i need to make sure my kids know that whatever they get themselves into they've got an ear they got a shoulder they got they got somebody to rely on i'm not going to likely agree with every individual choice they make but i'm not the one living that life mm -hmm. um and i don't know like the the kid that thought he had it all figured out dad i want my inheritance now let me go live dad's like okay i'll be here you know i you know you wonder what that story would look like in a modern context like done as a play uh just to just to be satire for the modern church you know babylon b style maybe Thank you I all think for that, that genuineness. I think the perfect church would be the one that doesn't have any rules. Doesn't have any what? You know, any rules. <clears throat> I when, when I probably three days after I became a believer, everybody told me that Christianity is all about a relationship. And I understand that they're talking about a relationship with God, but um that they, they, they kind of miss out on the idea of having a relationship with each other that mimics a relationship with God. And every church I've been into uh, or been involved with has been not a relationship, but an organization that, that laid out these kind of guidelines or laid out these kind of rules, or even if they were unwritten, they were always there. They were always behind the scenes. One of the most disastrous things I ever did was early on when I was just a brand new believer as I went uh, with another guy to confront a guy over his um, infidelity or something that he is, was suspect of. His marriage was on the rocks, put it that way. And uh, after I, it didn't go well, as you might imagine. And after that was all over with, I thought, that was really dumb. I have no right to be in this man's life. I don't even know his name. I don't even know who he is. Uh, you know, I had no relationship with him. I had no, there was no space in there for me. And, and why would he listen to me? Anyway, I, I was a nobody to him. And this this whole idea of relationship, I think, is just really key. And that's why God, you know, designed I, the churches to have relationships one with another that were such that um, we could lovingly correct one another or admonish one another or encourage one another. I always used um, my dad and, and I as, a, as an example because fortunately, only by God's grace, I had a super dad. And I didn't, I didn't uh, do things right because of the rules that he laid down. I, I did things right when I did them, and I wasn't a perfect kid, but when I did them, I did them because I didn't want to disappoint him. It was that relationship that I valued. And so there were certain things that I knew that he would probably be pretty disappointed with. And so that was the perspective that I, or that is the perspective I think the church should should work towards is, is developing that kind of a relationship instead of having all these rules. You know, that's a, that's a recipe for legalism, no matter how you cut it. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Mark. Um, I like that aspect of relationship with each other as well. Um, I think Richard, you had your hand up a second ago, yeah. Well, yeah, he was he was talking about um, uh, you know allowing. I think it was Kyle. He was talking about kids and allowing them to, you know, sometimes they, they sometimes they gotta go and and learn for themselves. Um. And, uh, you know, God didn't stop Adam and Eve from eating the fruit. Yeah. You know, and I, I, uh, I my mom gave me a free reign and my older sisters. Uh, I probably should have had a shorter leash than them, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, um, to, 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 to just go and be. And you know what? I mean, I, um, my life almost ended in a failed suicide attempt, you know, and I, that was when I was 19 and it was shortly after that, I've heard about Jesus Christ, you know, but you know, 
I like did the exact opposite to my kids. Like I have the personal experience and feeling that no matter what I do, however willful the sin may be, I'm already forgiven and I will be forgiven and God will never stop loving me. I already know that. And I teach grace to everyone I see. And I failed with so many of my kids because I'm probably the last person that they would ever want to come and talk to if they had a real problem. Because I put the rules down. I preached against legalism all my life. The whole time exemplifying it. Hmm. Not seeing myself doing it. And I finally told my kids, I mean, my oldest is 25. My youngest just turned 13. So, yeah, it's a little late. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, I guess it's never too late. But I said, you know what? You kids are old enough. Uh, if you don't want to come to church with me and your mother on Sundays, you don't, you don't have to. You're old enough if you feel the desire to ask me more about God, want to know about God, have questions about God, please ask. I always want to discuss God. I am always want to talk about God. Um, and I wish I had done that earlier. But I uh, I like being here because it's a safe place. I feel like I can, I don't have to put on that oh, I don't talk this way at home, or I don't watch this bad show, or I don't, you know, I smoked for 30 years and pretended that I didn't, you know what I mean? And yeah. it wasn't that I was afraid to. I don't think lighting tobacco on fire and breathing in the smoke is a sin. I think using it as a crutch of an addiction can potentially become a sin because I'm not relying on, 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 on Christ to as I said earlier, fill a, a void that I'm trying to, I'm trying to fill a hole. So I'm not fulfilled some way, somehow, if I feel like I have to do this over and over again. I don't think you, you see what, you see what I'm getting at. And I, I, I want my, yeah. I want, I want my kids to understand full and total grace. And I want the outside world of people that, that aren't in my sphere of influence when they think of me to think, you know, that guy is a guy who shows, Grace, it's not my place to tell the outside world how they should live their lives. And it certainly isn't my place to tell other believers as well. They have the Holy Spirit. I'm not their Holy Spirit. We it's interesting. Sometimes, yeah. Thank you, Richard. I think of the um, story of where Jesus goes to the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil. Of course, he could do that. He's Christ. Son of God. But also we see where Jesus was also trying to teach Peter how to walk on the water even though he didn't succeed, at least the time of the story that we read. And then we think of someone like um Others that fasted for 40 days, whatever you want to put down there. You know, there's a there's that point of growth. That's what I appreciate about what Roberta and all of you have said, is that that we've got to allow people the ability to grow. Richard, you weren't there however many years ago when you were the one drinking and smoking and chewing and cussing around, running around with all those that do. But then now you've grown to a point, and it may have taken that time of separation for you to, stepped outside of that box, but now you can step back into that box and not feel drawn and tempted by those things anymore. And it doesn't just have to be smoking or chewing. I mean, let's just put, you know, being, being whatever personality you want to put on that, um, that we just aren't critical, that we aren't judgmental towards people when we're around them. We can have a conversation and be um, genuine and just, not be critical towards one another. And, and that's, you know, and just have that authenticity of, you know, no judgment, but 
tra helping tr transcending in a way that we help others transform closer to a better them. I came to a spot with my, uh, I have three sons and with um, at least two of them that that went the prodigal way. And I said, you know, the, I, a couple of things I just want to communicate to you, and that is that I love you no matter what, how, how deep you go down this path. Um, I'll always have, you know, an open heart for, uh, uh, like Richard said, you know, if you want to talk, I'll pray for you, I'll, you know, I'll I'll do whatever I can, uh, but I won't facilitate what you're doing. Um, I can't. And so you just need to know that um, if it comes to you being bailed out of jail or whatever it is, you're, you're going to have to work that out for yourself. You're going to have to suffer the consequences that come along with what you propose to do. Um, but just for me to, to communicate that. Now they're in their 40s and they've come around and uh, uh, not completely, but they've they're in that progress of, of that journey of coming around and understanding that whole thing. A couple of them have kids of their own, so. It is a, it's a little uh, past 8.30. It's 8.35. Go ahead, Jason, and then we'll uh, start to wind down. So I was just going to say that, Kevin, you're always talking about those those growth cycles. And listening to all this thing about the, the, the rules and, and, and relationships, my mind went to my personal experience. Like I, I know I had to break free of some ideology, like you're, you're, you're talking about in different, on different um, uh, episodes and uh, other just prior, prior times in my life. I, I could speak that I really needed those rules at some point. Right. Yep. Because just, just how you're framing the world, like your mind doesn't operate in a vacuum. You've got to have something that's, that's, that's framing things. And uh, until you out, outgrow those rules, you have that's kind of how you're shaping things. I had a minister once that that said, you, you know, and parents are like, oh, you don't have to go to church. And I'm not saying like in, in your specific case, Richard, it just made me think of this. He goes, we teach our kids to brush their teeth. You have to brush your teeth before they go to bed type thing. And he goes, but then we want to tell them like, oh, you don't have to go to church. It's like, well, yes, we're going to do that just like you were brushing your teeth until they get to a point where they understand the, the the why is more yeah. right and it's just like okay the rules are needed but it's like the the greatest of these is love right <laughs> yeah there's um that rules and structure i was talking to paul about this rules and structure can be very necessary even if they're not great even if you were raised mormon or muslim or something having something by which you can measure how far you've moved or changed is like a necessity that you need later in life no matter what that is some some kind of a starting point by which you can determine how much yeah how far you've come in other directions we are a little over time is there any burning thought that you have to get off and i'll i'll make this announcement here too next week when we do fsi we're going to be offline and not recorded, okay? We're going to go back to that. Uh, we've done three weeks live streaming it, and we will go back to uh, offline and not recorded next week and then uh, see see how that goes. Are we still <laughs> going to be looking at the web video? I don't know. Well, maybe not next week. Maybe we'll do that some more. Maybe we'll go live again in the future. But um, next week might just be, yeah, might be something else. Just an open conversation, question, answer, comment, uh, guidance. I, I believe a certain part of, a part of structure is important. And I, it was interesting when Webb talked about that concerning when he wrote his songs. that the, He chose to have a certain um, foundational structure in the way he went about it. Or guidelines. I mean, they weren't legalistic per se, but they were just gentle boundaries or were boundaries, you know, of direction, if you will. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Anybody else got anything you got to say before we go? 
I just want to thank Richard for being here and for his honesty and for all the comments that he made. It was great having you here and new, new fresh eyes and new perspective. And yeah. thank you yes, very welcome. much for being so Second real. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see everybody again tonight. All yeah. right, guys. Next week, uh, offline. Okay. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. And uh, thanks for contributing uh, all your comments and all that. And we will see you soon.